Hey, 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 my name is Paul Schlings. Welcome to Lucid 9. And, well, I finally, finally got my diploma and finally got the document that states that I passed one of the language exams. But, well, as you hear about it, it's been actually pretty a while since then. So, yeah. Well, never mind. We are supposed to go to the drama club, obviously, because because why not? And it's not a bad idea, so some make-believe might be just what I need, especially with Akira. If that display on the rooftop is anything to go by... What classroom? To see, be there or be a cupcake. Because, you know, a square is just so yesterday. And cupcakes are delicious. I roll my eyes, but I'm smirking as I enter the classroom. Okay... Yeah, this should make my day considerably less crappy. Maybe. To see is just as generic as freebie. In fact, the only difference with my classroom is that it's currently filled with a scattered group of students. The number seems to be fewer than when I was last here. Good day, General! Akira pop up. Pops from beneath the desk, face shining in a cherry green. Glad you decided to join us. I end up smiling back. So, what's going on today? Oh, just improv exercises, having some fun and all that jazz. Our impromptu performance the other day was about as successful as a Puritan party, so we're taking today to relax and gather our morale. So, it didn't go well. I can say with 100% confidence that it was absolutely terrible. And that's why the room is so empty. I see that looking escapes... Uh, I see that nothing escapes your eyes, Mr. Holmes. Yes, men of our own number have deserted us. We are left stranded in the desert, wretched alone. Oh, whoa. Despite the dramatism of her tone, I notice that she seems to be happier. You like that there's less people, don't you? Well, that sounds so unpleasant. Rather, a smaller and more intimate group provides for better screen time coverage in the case that our lives are made to the show. A show. What? Think about it. Stories with, with large ensemble casts often purely focus on external conflict, while smaller casts allow room for individual character development and realization. That's how a lot of TG TV shows work, you know? And that's why smaller casts are worse for you if you break a bow. Just when I thought I was beginning to understand her, something like this happens. I see. Of course you do, you have two functioning eyes. Before I can respond to the absurdly literal statement, the club president claps her hands, gathering the attention in the room. Okay guys, I don't think anyone else is coming, let's get started. The group shuffles into a circle. The president's eyes land on me. Her eyes widen noticeably. Oh, yeah, my Shimoto, great to have you here. You remember me. Why, of course, Akira. Akira frantically makes some kind of vague gesture with her hands. The president coughs. Akira brought you here for Rain Spy, right? It wasn't that long ago. I noticed their unusual actions, but decide to ignore it. Right. Well, you're in luck. Today I've got some great exercise pl exercises planned. You guys ready? The group, for small, lets out a hearty roar. The president slides her hat toward the middle of the room. Inside it lies a tangled mass of paper. Okay, let's just do some warm up improv. Akira, do you mind? It'd be a pleasure, press. She eagerly shuffles forward and snatches a random slip. Her eyes drift over the words. My character is a lawyer. Good, uh, Tatsuya, why don't you match her? Sure thing, Brash! He also extracts a sleep and snorts, it, snorts in his belief. A dragon with an attachment complex to captive princess. To his captive princess. Great, you guys know the drill. Three minutes, ready? Akira straightens, adjusting her jacket. Her partner leaves on the desk and curls lively, as if he's actually a dragon. Go! Akira strides forward, whipping her finger at her partner. Hold it, Mr. Dragon! Are you not aware of the severe consequences associated with kidnapping? I'm a serious felony offense. It's a serious felony offense. Your lightest sentence will be the equivalent of 20 human years or more if you do not cooperate at once. 
No, you can take her from me. She's mine, my precious. Akira stops her hand convincingly on the table. You are the defendant. We are not in the court of law. It's lawyer, go away before I fry you to a crisp. Take that, I thought the dragons were supposed to be creatures of honor. Must I challenge you to a duel? Her partner gives a long, dreary sigh, as if genuinely disturbed by Akira's incessant presence. Fine, you want to know, little lawyer, why I refuse to forfeit my precious? Enlighten me! Simply this, little lawyer, you are playing to be by the code of humans, I am playing by the code of dragons. Shall I tell you what the code of dragons states? That a dragon can kidnap my any poor innocent soul whenever they flow, please? No, in fact, little lawyer, it is prohibited for a dragon to withhold a precious maiden for more than 24 hours against her will, barring the major extenuating circumstance. Which is? If the place to which she must return is worse than in our possession. The room gasps slightly, even Akira's confidence falters. She... what? My dear, dear precious little lawyer was cruelly abused in her own castle. It is safer for her here than anywhere else. But that can't be. A brief silence falls on the group, punctuated by the shrill tone of an alarm. The club president hastily waves her phone as the room breaks into applause. Time up! Great job! Akira Tatsuya! That was really creative! That plot twist was a brilliant comeback, Tatsuya! It was so fun to watch! When Akira sits next to me, I lean closer to her. So, this is just an improv where anything goes? Actually, it's more like a battle of wits, as the improv continues, a scenario is created, where each person clearly takes one side. While staying in the character, they must figure out how to win the battle of wits before time's up. That doesn't seem very even. Oh no, I'm just no good at it. You see, I should have said that the princess was actually Spartan, therefore what the dragons uh, perceive as abuse, society perceives as normal. <laughs> that kind of improv concept is very interesting. I've never thought of something like that before. Okay, next! Yama, yeah, wanna give it a try? Sure, no! <laughs> I pluck a slip of paper from the hat. <laughs> Just my luck, a delinquent boy. What'd you get, General? An honorable samurai? A terrific knight? Sorry to disappoint, but... Hi guys, I'm so sorry for being late! Suddenly the door flies open and Rui comes rocketing into the room, dumping her backpack on the ground. My mind runs completely blank. Rui, she's part of the drama club. Ah, I had completely forgotten. Ah, oh, perfect time! Rui, why don't you play opposite Yama? We're doing battle improv. Eh? Hey. Rui's eyes land on mine. Surprised, edged clearly over her features. Guilt churns in my stomach as she shoves away, her smile adopting a clearly awkward hint. Um, I, I, I probably... Come on, the hat's waiting. I think I, I forgot something. She inches through the doorway. I rub my fingers in my pockets, trying to stem the stifled air out of my lungs. Rui! Rui holds in her steps, staring pleadingly at Akira. Why don't you be Yama's partner? Horror spreads across Rui's face. Fierce indignation rears in my stomach. I bite my tongue to keep my words back. Why of all days for her to interfere? Why today? Does she know what happened between Rui and me? Is this her way of ex exacting revenge? Since she got in a fight with Rui? I have to go, Akira. What? Rui? And Rui quickly scopes up her backpack and bolts from the room. Akira's face falls. Well, it was worth a shot. What's gotten her so antsy? An uncomfortable silence descends upon the room. It's more than I can bear. I hardly grab my backpack. My mind still clouded with anger. Sorry, I have to go to. Thanks for the performance fall. Wait, you took already? General, why? Goodbye, Akira. I am barely able to keep the snap out of my eyes as I rush out of the classroom. And that's when the track training is worth, shows its results. I stop only when I break into fresh air. My thoughts, now broken from their mold, are racing uncontrollably in my head. Rui, train, Shoji's death, seeing Rui, yelling at Rui, hurting Rui. I have even forgot that she was in the drama club. General, hold up! Akira sprints to me, face raw with worry. Why did you leave all of a sudden? I clench my jaw, working to keep my words civil. Ah, uh, uh, Akira, I need to be honest with me. Okay. Did you also ask Rui to come to drama club today? She usually comes, but I wanted to make sure. That sounds fair enough. Why do you want to make sure? Because you wanted to meet us to meet. Yeah. 
Akira, please. I've told you this before, but you need to stop mending. Look, Ray and I fought yesterday. What just happened in the classroom? Well, I think you might have made the scenario a whole lot worse. John, I know that you and Ray fought. What? My anger blossoms in my stomach. Then why did you plan this? Did you intentionally try to make us miserable? Is this because you and Ray are on bad terms? No, Ray and I made up a long time ago. Well, actually, it was just yesterday. But still! This appeases me slightly. I try to withhold my accusations. Then why? You need to make up with Roy, General. I wasn't there, so I don't know who was wrong and who was right, but it's always best to apologize first. The words are unusually straight and simple, especially coming from her. Still, I don't appreciate how she's meddling, yet again. Here's a thing, I don't even know if we will make up. We might just not talk to each other again. Move on with our lives. That's exactly what can happen, General! Don't you see? You move on, you live loose ends, and you end with regrets that fa uh, fester inside you like mozzarella cheese in an India summer. Even if it's painful, you need to make up. Because by the time we're ready, it's too late. She sinks in the bench for the first time. I realize that her cheap her demeanor belies an exhausted face. Too late. She spends a moment in pensive silence before she speaks. I can sense a story behind her heavy words. General, you know Shoji, this unfortunate soul who recently died. I do. More than I wish I did. He was in my class. I just take a moment to swallow this fact. Shoji had to be part of the class. Of course, I just hadn't thought of such an association. I saw him, General. I knew Akane. I knew their relationship. I knew that she disappeared and he was taking it hard. I saw the signs, every single one. He'd joke about suicide, he wouldn't talk with anyone, except his closest friend, Har, but Har was in a different class, he wouldn't eat, wouldn't sleep, he even was giving his stuff away, and he was saying goodbye to everyone. It's morbidly fascinating, even while I can sense the heavy sense of guilt in Akira's words, I find the back of my mind cataloging that Shoji was planning to die. That incident at the train was suicide. I quickly got myself, now's not the time to think about this, I need to understand Akira. The wave associated with the guilt. It's not something that she should bear in the first place. He was a textbook example of a suicidal finger. General and I just ignored him. Too awkward to talk to him. Too weird to approach him normally. I did nothing. Roy, Roy took talk with him. She did what I should have. She did. When did she? No, I shouldn't be surprised. There's something Roy would do. Roy with her big soft heart. The heart that I brutally crushed. Akira, that just so that this death isn't your fault. If Shoji died regardless of what she said. No, John, I could have done something. If I had just talked to him, if I had just smiled once, just wait once, just let him know that he mattered. He died, General, he died and it was too late. I'd always thought that Akira's bubbly exterior would allow the, all the troubles of the world to bounce right off her skin, but she's taking Shoji's death harder than anyone I've seen. The pain in her voice is nearly palpable. Ah, damn it. <clears throat> ah! My leg. You know, that feeling in the leg that you must switch position basically. Ah! Well, won't, wa won't be able to walk for. A few seconds because of that. Ow. But not that I will walk actually, no. Alright. General, that's what can't happen with Rui. Life is just too short. You know what the next day will bring. You could get run over by car. Or Rui could get run over by car. Or a nuclear bomb will hit you somewhere and wipe out the entire population. It might sound stupid, but you have to make up now before you have any regrets. She laces her fingers together and stares at them. So please talk with Rui, General. Don't let the skirmish turn into a seven year war. It's clear and open everything that not Akira, but everything Akira all at once. I know I should be apathizing with her pain, but all I can think is that I'm pressed. There's much more to hear. To her, a deep heart that I never knew was there. I tried to make up. I tried to smile originally. She turns it, her shoulders relaxing. Well, if you need some aid, you can always call for backup. I have a particularly dangerous concoction known as the matchmaking plan. All it requires is a nearby movie theater, a bucket of roses. This isn't for a date. Well, who's to say that it can be? 
I snorted it, but it comes out a little more affectionate than I was expecting. Let's stick with a simple apology. Well, General, even if you want to be boring, I do want to give you any help I can offer. Thanks for the fall, but it's something I should do myself. Uh, it's between me and Rui, so I'll take responsibility for it, not you. Akira freezes at this statement. Did I hurt her feelings? I appreciate the offer fault. She only averts her gaze and shuffles away. It concerns me. Akira! What? What's wrong? Nothing. I just, you know. That's really cool of you, General. It's very admirable. Admirable. That I take responsibility for my own crap. Well, I don't know. Is it time for me to get going? It must be. They'll be all. They all be wondering where I am. See, you, General. Thanks for stopping by. And please make up with reason. Bye. And just as suddenly as she appeared, Akira bolts away. Her words are strange. Her analogies are unthinkable. And half the time, I'm not sure if we're speaking the same language. But today, I felt closer with her than most of my long-time friends. <sighs> Amazingly enough, I think that we are actually starting to reach some semblance of understanding. Ah. Ah. I head back to my apartment, pondering the encounter in my mind. It's still lined by, out by the time and then. The day stretches ahead of me, full of possibilities that don't actually exist. I could study if there was any point in doing so, so I could hang out with my friends if I hadn't already screwed them over somehow. I should just talk to them, honestly, and apologize. At the very least, hear their side of the story, try to understand what exactly is going on in their minds. And yet I don't. Even I'm not completely sure why, because I don't have the possibility to choose here. The only clue lies in this nagging thought in the back of my mind. Maybe it's better that I don't know you. Maybe it's better if they don't, didn't have to blow off classes in order to find vague clues for an even vaguer case. Maybe it's better if they weren't forced to deal with some depressed kid who never got over his sister's death. Maybe their lives would be easier. If that's the case, the only thing I can do for anyone, really, is to solve this case. Solve this case and stay out of the way. This, the key, lies in my laps. Everything could change depending on what I saw last night. You're a coward. We'll see about that. I need to know why that exchange took place and what it meant. I break out of my train of thought, pondering my next course of action. If the doctors can be trusted, all I need is a strong trigger, something that can give my brain a nice kick. Like a bloodied corpse. Right, easy. I raise my phone, hands shaking, no seat churns in my stomach as I bring up my browser search engine, switching the mode to images. I can do this. For Rui, for Masato, Yahiko, Mr. Yata, Shigure, for the people who died. For Mizu, I tap the screen with finality. Gruesome. Scenery floats my pupils, pulsing into my brain like black oil. It wraps around me, strangling my breath out of my lungs, laughing softly in my ears. Too late? I struggle against it, but the empty eyes, the wash of organs and vines, it sends my head reeling. I vaguely feel myself turn over, retching. A lapse pa pushes at me, but I push back, reaching it to the furthest depths of my mind. Remember! 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 And you can do it. A clear, high voice pierces through the hazes of my mind. What? I know you can do it! I'm dumped into the yard of some primary school, where there's a grass and trees and no towering monoliths of skyscrapers. It's most definitely a suburb. I'm sitting on a swing, and a tiny girl with legs that don't even reach the ground is on the swing next to me. She's a brave one. With every extension of her legs, she pushes higher and higher until she's almost horizontal with the bars. Then I realize that I'm also tiny and my own legs don't reach the ground. Ah, this day. I remember it well. I remember it to the point of painstaking detail. I remember how the sun felt on my face, how the flowers sang in the wind, how the delighted shrieks of children were a soundtrack that played endlessly in the background. I remember despising it at all, because no one should have been happy. Not when I had to move, not when adults keep, kept saying things I didn't understand. Not when Mizu was gone. So, when they come, just tell them, okay? The girl's cheery voice broke me out of my thoughts. I was barely swaying back and forth on the swing, a comical juxtaposition to her vivid enthusiasm. Okay. 
It was not okay, I was not okay, and I would not just tell him. But as a child, I had very quickly learned that saying okay was the easiest thing to do. Saying okay made people happy, saying okay made people leave you alone. But this girl was an exception. As she swung down, she suddenly ground her heels in the bark, munched beneath her feet. Wood chips sprayed at me. I promptly le leapt to my feet, yelping in the indignation. Hey! The girl jumped from her swing, landing in front of me. When she stood up, her hair seemed to glow like fire in the sunlight. Promise? I flicked bits of bark off my elementary school uniform, nodding duly. Okay. Pinky promise? She stuck out a hand. I shoved my in my pockets. Okay. You aren't pinky promising. Cross my heart. Hope to die? I didn't speak because I suddenly felt funny. The girl's eyes widened. Oh, maybe you shouldn't hope to die. Your sister is already dead. She said that solemnly, and as a seven-year-old I had absolutely no concept of political correctness, so I only shrugged. Yeah. It's okay, there's lots of trampolines in heaven. Trampolines and flowers. Okay. And the girl threw with sank her piece, leapt back onto her swing and continued her crazy quest to the top. I only made shapes in the bark mulch with the tip of my shoe. Suddenly the girl hunched her knees to her chest and pointed frantically in the distance. Hey, hey, they're coming, hey! I shrunk against the swing. I didn't need to look where she was pointing. I already knew what lay in that direction. Come on, Yama, get up! No. You promised! No, I didn't. Yes, you did. You just promised. No, I... Hey, you pophead! I stiffened and glanced meekly at the newcomers. Four older children, bigger in every dimension, with glittering eyes and smiles that were far too cheery for this time of day. Or any time of day, for that matter. You're a stupid poophead. Yeah, why don't you play like us? He doesn't even talk with anyone! Just search at us with those freaky freak arms! Like this freaky freak name! Yeah man, what a stupid poophead name! He's a mountain! The crazy girl slammed her shoes into the ground again, spraying mulch at them. They didn't even flinch, instead they grinned widely. Ooh, he's with a girl! Having fun with your little girlfriend, freak freak! Uh. I only hunched my shoulders and took the abuse. The girl, on the other hand, curled her fingers into fists, crouching aggressively. He's not my boyfriend. We don't kiss yet. Yeah, man, Rui, sitting in a tree. Kissing. I bet he got cooties from her. I don't have cooties. Oh, don't get too close, guys. You might get some. Run away. As the girl, Rui launched after them. The four split and ran circles around her, laughing crocosly. Hey guys, I came up with song. Yama Yama needs his mama. Freaky freak, just like a uh, llama. Yeah, what's a llama? Doesn't matter. Yama Yama needs his mama. Freaky freak, just like a llama. Needs a girl to fight, fight, fight. Cause he has no might, might, might. They slapped their hands together, laughing truly as I fought to keep the stink out of my eyes and throat. Okay. I said this placidly, saying OK would make them happy, saying OK would make them leave me alone. But just as they were about to lose interest, Rui sucked one of them straight in the face with her fist, rage twisting her cherubic features. Her target collapsed to the ground, sniveling but the rest only laughed. You hit like a girl! Is that the best you can do? Freaky freak and his freaky girlfriend. I'm not his girlfriend! What on earth is going on here? A teacher jogged over to the scene, followed by a crowd of twittering students. Reese eyes lit up, thinking that help was coming. I only continued to stare at my shoes, I knew what would happen. Teacher, these poor bullies are... Teacher, Yama hurt me! Look at him, teacher, I think he's going to die! Yama is not being nice, you said we should be nice, right? At the flip of the switch, the bullies had transferred into a pile of sniveling clueless victims to the odious freaky freak. The teacher examined the scene before her, pursing her lips. The crowd awaited her judgment. Even at seven years old, I already knew what it would be. Yama, understand all the bad feelings you must be dealing with, but you can't hit people, okay? Infuriated, Rui jumped in front of me, yelling at the top of her lungs. They're lying, teacher! I hit him! The teacher smiled tenderly at her. Rui, I know that you are very nice and you want to protect Yama, but he needs to take responsibility for his own mistakes. Yama, come with me. We need to see the principal. Okay. I suddenly got to my feet and passed through the crowd to her side, still staring at my shoes. I could hear the bullies stickering in the background. But Rui grabbed at my sleeve, whispering softly but intensely. You know what? I'm gonna ask mommy and daddy. I'm gonna ask them 
how to get back at those those poop heads. Baby, sir, just you wait. She released me, the teacher led me away, a proper criminal to the execution block. I tried to forget the encounter, to strangle the hope that was rapidly rising in me. Sooner or later, she would get tired of me. Sooner or later, she would decide to leave. Sooner or later, she would just be another face in the crowd calling me freaky freak. She never did. She moved cities and started attending the academy. I followed her out, all the while expecting that one day she would realize that she didn't have to be with a freak and she could have any friend she wanted. And on that day, I would have moved to Isamu for nothing. But that day never came. I wake blurly to a hammering dual sound, almost like someone pounding at my door. Open the door, Mishimoto, I know you're in there! Come on, get to the door, you bloody prat! I love myself a moment to take in my surroundings. Looks like it's already night time. How long have I been out? Don't make me break this down! Every attack on the door drives further into my headache. Make me wince. What is Elizabeth even doing at my apartment this hour? Just quiet down for a second, okay? The pounding stops, finally. Turning on the lamp, I glance around. At some point, I throw my jacket on the ground. Thankfully, there's no vomit or other body discharge to be seen or smelled. Did I fall unconscious? Did something else happen? I'm waiting! Five minutes, your majesty. I struggle to my feet and head to the door. A sudden spell knocks me over. I barely catch myself on the kitchen counter in time. But as a result, my hand slips on a cup, sending it crashing to the ground. I wince at the, as the harsh sound scrapes against my eardrums. Porcelain rockets to every corner of the room, skittering across the tile. Good God, what's going on there? Dots spin in front of my vision as I struggle to the doorway. Something cuts into my foot. I roughly shake it out. Finally, I manage to open the door. Elizabeth's door glare promptly melts into shock. Yama! Happy. I sto stop to pick up the porcelain, but my foot twinkles with pain. Wincing, I crash to the ground and examine my heel. Why are you bleeding? I point wordlessly to the shards of the cup. Elizabeth sighs, gingerly plucking them from the corners and dumping them to the trash. You seem to be getting into these scraps quite often. Hey, it's not every day I break a cup. She ponders this silently. It's only then when I actually clock the time. What are you even doing here? No, actually, how did you know where I live? She flicks the last of the shards into the trash can, then turns to me, hands on her hips. Is that really what matters not now? Look first, we need to take care of your food. Where's your first aid kit? A... I don't know, but tell her. I will just point to the medicinal cabinet in the kitchen. Bottom shelf next to the stove. She crisply strikes the cabinet, pulling a pipe of antibacterial ointment and a gauze of wrap. Food. I can bandage it myself. I can do it better. Are you seriously turning this into a competition? That was what I... I just, just stick out your leg. I don't have the will to argue with her. I silently just extend my hood. She wets the towel and dabs it against my heel, so... We're lucky that it, this is a shallow cut. There is not even any glass in it. Sure. She expertly slicks the ointment, then bends the injury with the rub, as if she's done so a thousand times. The fluidity of her motions are almost hypnotizing. As she finishes, she suddenly speaks, her voice unusually soft. Why were we at the train station yesterday? I freeze at her words, withdrawing my foot and taking a step back. Train station. Did she see me free? Is this about Shoji's death? I decide to stick with a cautious answer. She was planning on committing from home, so she had to take her stuff to the train station. I was just... That's not what I meant, Yama. And you know it. Why were we at the seat where an academic student died? My mouth runs dry. I work to speak past the age in my throat. What? Shoji. Shoji has a go. He died at the train station and you were there. How do you know that? Would you just tell me? Why were you there at that exact moment? The pressure from her words peers down on me heavily. I make my way over to the couch and take a seat. Where did there to? Yeah, my chance answer. How did you know? Why are you always so insufferable? I might not be your best friend, but don't you trust me? Just one bit? My exhaustion, my nosy, my dizziness, it culminates in a lump of long greed and resentment. Insufferable? I'm the one who was insufferable. I was just a normal student in normal class. I didn't cause trouble, I didn't bother anyone. Who bothered from whom first? Who insulted whom first? Who was the person who pretended to be a friend? I wasn't pretending, I was trying to help you. Oh yeah, you were an angel. Nagging at criticizing and micromanaging me. You should have just done my homework for me. Let me ask you, did I ever ask you for help? Did I ever ask for you to tell me that I was trash at everything? Look, I admit that I made some mistake, but I was trying to help you. 
Well, I thought so too, until that project. Don't tell me that I'm insufferable, you're the one who started it. Elizabeth breathed loose visibly and grabbed my shoulders. Her breath is hot against my face. A current of lavender and vanilla brushes against my cheek. What did you expect? Did you think I would baby you around? You dumped that project. You left me to the everything. You don't know how many old nighters I had to pull just to get the bloody project poster done in time. Uh, that poster isn't even. Isn't even what? Worth anything? It's worth a great yama and greater money. More than that, it was the CityLink project that was worth 50% of our grade. I blink his price at this fact. Honestly, I never checked the syllabus. The fact that one project would be worth so much in is alien to me. I sat quiet and released my shoulders, sitting down on the opposite end of the couch and folding her hands in her lap. Do you come to the school is just pocket change? Not exactly. My parents aren't billionaires or anything. Maybe, but you can slack and you'll come back another semester. You can scrub by at the bare minimum and stay assured that you'll remain a student. But I need to work for it, so that I'm not a burden on my father. He's already so busy with work. The house, and with me, education is just out of the question. She seems to shrink inwardly, looking oddly defeated. I try to walk past my shock and phrase, phrase my next question delicately. Your mom uh, doesn't send help? She's dead. To be honest, I see that coming actually here. From the context of hers. But still. God damn it, he uh, makes it a bit difficult. Jeff Fulton. She recovers and stares at me in the eye. You already know that I'm a part timer in the cafe, even while I keep up the illusion of being rich to others. But the absolute best thing I can contribute is maintaining an academic scholarship at the academy. My cynical side can't help but love scholarship. Who'd work so hard to come to a school like the academy? But at the same time, if I'm fair, I know that it's one of the best high schools around. Shows you just how much quality of education has deteriorated since the depression. To Yama, it may seem like I only cared about my grade. And yeah, I was controlling and I wanted to control every aspect of the project. But it wasn't just for a nice letter or on a card, it was to keep my scholarship. If I had let things fly, I wouldn't have lost it. What? With you dropping the other end, the most I could have gotten in that curse was 50 points, if that's worth half my grade. Well, there goes the scholarship. I absorb this quiet. Truthfully, I don't even know how to respond. I didn't know. I'm aware of that now. My grades are my life like hood. Uh, so is how I uphold myself on peers. My extracurricular activities, my everything really. A full scholarship to a school like this is nothing to sneeze at. But we're basically just left to school. Well, I won't deny it, it felt that way a lot. But it doesn't matter as long as I can win it back. She trails off, her eyes drifting to the distance. I nudge her. Win what? Ah, uh, nothing. Yeah, that sure looks like nothing. Well, it's not important at the moment. What I want to know is why you were such an insufferable arse on the project. Love, as I am to admit it, you weren't completely awful until it started. Her subtle insults almost seem to hold a teasing edge. It prompts me to reply honestly. Well, your nagging was irritating and your opinions were bad. Honestly, I didn't care that much until this one day where you mentioned my sister. Sister? She seems generally aghast at this nugget of information. You don't remember? I didn't even know you had a sister. Oh, interesting. At that time, I thought it was a deep insult. Oh, and your sister thought so too? Well, she's dead. Oh, bit hard. Just a bit. I sorry then. I don't know. Was that why you dropped the project? Something like that. Well, it makes sense. A moment of silence falls between us as we work to process these revelations. Honestly, it feels pretty alien to share a civil conversation with Elizabeth. Up until just a week ago, we'd been at each other's throats on a nearly daily basis. This story really is like pride and prejudice, isn't it? But, well, I've gone so long misunderstanding you. Well, so have I. I guess both of us are, of us are Mr. Darcy. And Elizabeth Bennet. I, I suppose everyone is to some extent. You more than most. Miss half English woman whose name is Elizabeth. And you as well, Mr. Takes his well for granted. Before I can respond to this, she clears her throat. But this is getting off topic. Seriously, Yama, I need to know why you were at that train station. 
My guard instantly rises. Even for Elizabeth doesn't seem to have any bad intentions. Just the mention of the trauma puts me on alert. Why do you know? Elizabeth rockets to her feet, her voice low as she glares down at me. Why? Because the Penguin Transfer, you could be the primary suspect in the recent disappearances. A primary suspect? But how would she know? Why would I? I was just... Do I need to spell it out? Katsu Kobayashi, he's a policeman. The one who found you in the forest a few days ago. Right around that time, I found a body in that same forest. A mutilated body of the student that matched the pattern of these appearances. Well, Katsu is in charge of Shoji Hasegawa's case at the train station. And what does he hear from his primary witness? That you were there. Of all bloody incompetent people, you somehow possess the intelligence and initiative to flawlessly kidnap and murder four to six people. I can tell whether she's insulting me or fighting for my innocence. Know that it matters when she knows so much. How do you... What? She throws her hands up in the air. Fine, my father is the bloody superintendent of the bloody Samu police department and Katsu is my family, a family friend. Now, will you tell me? I'm freaking speechless by this barrage of revelations. Elizabeth is the daughter of the police superintendent. Come to think of it. Maybe, maybe she has superior knowledge of dressing wounds because her dad is the police superintendent. Pieces start falling into place. Elizabeth's atypical look on the killings, her systematic behavior during the school investigation, how she knew how to handle gun, even just in laser attack. Something makes sense about her. If you're wondering, no, my father doesn't blab about confidential information. I learned as part of the investigative process that involved cats interviewing me. What? I wasn't even thinking about it. Then why are you wasting time? Just tell me what you were doing at the station napping. I told you I was just helping remove. Those are the words I want to say, but again. What was I doing? At the train station. I might just have I might have just fainted, but when I am sleeping, when I'm slapsing, I have no clue what I'm doing. Elizabeth's throne flattens into neutral curiosity. Yama Don't know. It's impossible to tell what's going on. Everything happened so quickly. The devs being drafted as an assistant, then being fired, more devs fights all over in the space of what nine days since school started. You're just being ridiculous. You either did something or you didn't. Look, just say that you did, couldn't have had anything to do with Shoji's death. What if I did? Then say that you did! Is it really that hard? Hard to admit that you could be a serial killer without even knowing. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty hard. Then again, ja she just thinks that I'm joking. And what if I don't know? Her expression quiets as she seems to understand. We're not seriously entertaining this idea, are you? For God's sake, Yama, you are a murderer! That's a lot of rubbish! You can know that for sure. Oh yes, I can! Look, it's blood impossible. Clearly, you're not the actual killer or you wouldn't be acting this way. Therefore, there is no reason that you would have anything to do with these killings. Stairs above, for a rational person, you should do awful little thinking. Ironically enough, the bite in her tone is comforting. She sounds so confident, like I could never be guilty, like I would never be able to hurt someone. But she doesn't know about my lapses. She doesn't know that I could potentially be a completely different person. Look, there are many things, Yama, but a murderer is not one of them. You've got to believe that. If you don't, no one will. Heh, <laughs> what if no one already does? Then you've got to show them, show them who you are. Show them what you can do. They will doubt you, they will fight you, maybe your friends will leave you. But you've got to fight back. I have no doubt that to any other person her speech would be amazingly inspirational. To any other person, life changes would be made and world views would be altered. But fighting bats, involving people, doing something, that's what I've been doing for this past week. Uncovering, investigating, taking initiative. And well, we saw how that turned out. Still, I have to admit that she stirs hope even in someone like me. Her words make me want to leap up, to raise my fists, to fight back. I just don't know if it will make things better or worse. Thanks, Elizabeth. She falters, her eyes widening. What? What? That's, that's the first time you didn't call me lazy. Would you prefer that? Not particularly, it simply feels old. Her eyes drift across mine, slowly, contemplatively. Well, done with your pity party? As close as I can get to down, I suppose, Miss Bennett. Uh, fair enough, Mr. Darcy, after all, I know how you enjoy your parties. Ah, yeah. You can tell by my acute desire to eat, drink and dance the night away. Why, the night is scarcely young. Wait, it's midnight. It's midnight! She leaps away, pointing to my clock in clear horror. Oh, looks like it is. 
good god, I have to get going now. She hurriedly shoves the medicine back in the cabin and scrambles to the doorway. I instinctively grab her sleeve. Wait, what's that? Let go, now. She doesn't look like she's going, so I quickly release her. Something dawns on me. Oh, academic curfew. What? No, I have permit because of my father's job. Does this curfew even exist? Or does everyone just ignore it? Then what is it? Homework? Sleep schedule? No, nothing like that. Shouldn't, shouldn't it be obvious? A girl is in a boy's home at a late hour? Ah, uh, what just that? Ah, uh, it's nothing to worry about. I've had plenty of girls over. Rui was one of them. Heck, she even knows the key code to my door. But Elizabeth doesn't seem to take this as comforting. In fact, she turns white as so she... Plenty of girls! It's fine, people don't care around here. I care! Do you know what this could do to my reputation? She paces agitatedly, wringing her hands. Her worry is stressing me. Look, like I said, it's not a big deal. Guys have girls over all the time. And girls have guys over all the time. She stops in her tracks and stares at me. Oh, as friends? Well, what else would they be doing? You're asking because you don't know? That is generally why people ask questions, yes. And according to you, girls come over and guys come over and they just study or play games or eat dinner or whatnot. In high school, that's how it's supposed to be. That's exactly. Wait, what were you thinking? My god, I can't believe we're having this conversation. She covers her face and rearranges her jacket, quickly opening the door. I'm just going to go now. I'm left flabbergasted as she slams the door in my face. I can't even get in a word. Well, that was abrupt. I swear, I'll never know what's going on in that head of hers. <laughs> it's probably, it probably doesn't mean anything to Yama. But I believe in you. Before I can make a move, she promptly shuts the door again. This time, I hear the rapid clink of her shoes against the apartment hallway as she strides out of the complex. She believes in me. Of all people, Elisa Patoshiro believes in me. Well, that's just like the irony of life, I suppose. I, I can't deny that it's torturing in the most bizarre way. Well, she's more confident than I am in my own innocence. I feel it's nice to have someone like that on your side. A fighter, a warrior, someone who you uh, know will tell the truth to your face, even if you don't want them to. I can trust her, weirdly enough. And with that, let's end the episode here. Well, I don't know where this is going, but we'll see soon, probably. So, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.